One of the things I, I really like about you, Scott, is, is exactly this sort of fearlessness and calling out scientific BS and, and defending uh, your views. And, and actually, in this regard, we, we kind of intersect a little bit because hmm. um, we've, we're both taken part in, in putting forth critiques of so-called theories of everything, which have become in vogue lately uh, with uh, Wolfram's proposal uh, and also Eric Weinstein's. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in Stephen Wolfram's case, right, he put forth his theory about a year or two ago based on hypergraphs and classical models of computation. Right. Uh, Eric I mean, Weinstein. I, I would consider it a variation of the theory he put forward 20 years ago. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I was going to I was going to get to that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then yeah. right. And then Eric Weinstein put forth his proposal in written mm -hmm. form finally a year ago. And it's mm -hmm. called geometric unity based on mm -hmm. gauge theory. And, ah, yeah, and you, I, you, ah, I knew I remembered your name from from some. Okay, good. You you were on that <laughs> paper that sort of pointed out the. Problem. Oh, okay. I I didn't know if you were aware of it, but yeah, okay. I was well, aware. That's good. Well, okay. Yes, I was. I, I was aware because you know I have met Eric Weinstein at various conferences. You know, so oh. a decade ago, I found him an incredibly interesting character. You know, I mean, he's you know to talk to. He is just full of you know these very unusual opinions about you oh. know just about any topic, and you know, but then he also had this 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 theory of everything and he had this this it was part of this sort of giant you know sort of indictment of the academic system that you know it had not it had failed to take this more seriously and uh you know and uh, of course you know I, I i don't know nearly enough about about gauge theory or about physics to judge the argument on its merits i was you know a little bit skeptical especially when you know people would like people who did know physics would be asking for more details and he would be like well that's your problem to work out the details. Like, that's <laughs> my problem right like, like what uh, it, well it, it ended up becoming my problem <laughs> 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 right. So no, but but I I I I did read your paper with with a lot of interest when it came out. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess maybe we could uh, get to that in a second. But mm. I I wanted to get back to Stephen uh, Wolfram. So you actually yeah you ah. wrote back you actually wrote a book review of his new kind of science back in two thousand and two. That was I think the I first time you 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 cr uh, critiqued him. Uh. So how what's been his response like? And yeah. uh, Do you have any thoughts? updated revised thoughts about what he's put forth. Okay, so uh so 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 I wrote a review of his book when I was uh, uh 19 years old and a, and a grad <laughs> student and uh I just, you know, uh uh you know pe uh, uh, people at, at Berkeley would had asked me questions about it and I just decided to spend a month uh over the summer just reading reading that entire book. And then, uh, you know, I felt like, okay, you know, I, uh, pe people are, are, you know, you know, I was reading all these popular articles talking about how this is, you know, revolutionizing science and basically just, you know, sort of buying it, you know, everything he had said about it. And I'm like, you know, how come like th there were no kind of, you know, academic reviews about this or like reviews from people who, who know about complexity theory, know about quantum physics, you know, know about the, the you know, the, 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 the things that he's talking about, and I said, oh, okay, you know, I, you know, even though I'm, I'm a complete unknown, like I could, I could be the first to to, to do that, and so, so I, I wrote this review, and the the main point I would say that that I that I made in that re review, I mean, I, I talked about how you know, okay, you know, he, you know, he 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 goes on for hundreds of pages about how simple programs can give rise to all these complex behaviors. And, and, you know, and he, he presents it as if it is a new discovery, right? Uh, you know, and he's like, okay, you know, of course there were people who, you know, kind of, you know, saw, you know, maybe Turing or von Neumann saw little glimmerings of this before, but, you know, no one really recognized the full picture until Wolfram comes along, right? And I'm like, no, that, you know, that, that, that's, that, that, that's not really true. Actually, a lot of us, even you know when we were when we were eleven or twelve years old, right? We were spending all our time making simple computer programs and running them and seeing what complicated emergent behavior they would give rise to. Like this is how we got into computer science in the first place, right? And and so so then you know there was that okay, but then there was kind of the 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 um the 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 one thing you know where, where one part of the book where I really felt like. Wolfram stuck his neck out and sort of said something, uh, um, you know, that would revolutionize physics if it were true, 
right? And this is that, uh, you know, he wants a classical cellular automaton that would even uh, uh, underlie quantum mechanics, right? And that would explain all the quantum phenomena. And, um, um, you know, and all the apparent randomness of, you know, uh, quantum mechanics would just be because we don't know the exact state of this, you know, classical deterministic cellular automaton. And, and then at some point he notices a problem with this and the problem is called the Bell inequality, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is, you know, one of the, the classic demonstrations that, you know, quantum entanglement is a real phenomenon, you know, that it cannot be explained by uh, what we would call local hidden variable theory, like by something like a classical cellular automaton, you know, if it respects spatial locality. Right. And, you know, that, that was actually just honored with the most recent Nobel Prize in physics. You know, the uh, uh, experiments that, that demonstrated that, that this Bell inequality is violated by nature, which means, you know, that, uh, uh, yes, you know, entanglement seems to be a real phenomenon in our universe. Uh, and, and so then, well, well, from at some, I think it's chapter nine of, of, of his book, at some point he, he, he notices that and says, okay, that, 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 that's no big deal. Uh, we just have to posit that in our, you know, cellular automaton underlying physics, there are some long range threads that can form once in a while. And those, you know, explain the uh, correlations between the entangled particles. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, it's it, like, it, you know, it's not as if no one has thought of such things before, right? You know, the trouble is once you have these kinds of long range threads, then, you know, they're going to, uh, you're, they're going to put you into conflict with special relativity, right? They're going to mean that, that you know, that, that it matters, like whether your update happens, you know, on the left first or on the right first, right? You know, it, you, you, you sort of break causal invariance. So like, like, like quantum mechanics has this very remarkable property that it's like precisely poised, you know, to allow entanglement and yet not allow faster than light communication, right? And the trouble is if you try to change anything, then you sort of, you break that delicate balance, right? And then, you know, either you, you fail to explain the, you know, uh, entanglement effects like the, the bell violation or else you go too far in the other direction and you start allowing faster than light communication, right? And so I, 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 I sort of spent pages, you know, I spent five pages just to, you know, be completely formal about why that is. And I, and I actually made a, made a point that uh, um, I, I hadn't quite seen before, but, but, but that, that the, the, uh, the, 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 the bell inequality you know, is doing more than just telling you about entanglement or about non-locality. It's actually telling you something about, you know, the need for sort of uh, uh, for, for nature to be generating randomness on the fly, right? So it's sort of, uh, um, um, you know, the, like, the, like the way that you get consistency with relativity is that like if let's say I have Alice and Bob who have entangled particles, right? And let and if Alice does something to uh to 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 her particle, like you know, the, like if, if you knew the the value of of you know the exact value of of uh, um uh, uh of, of like Alice's qubit, then you would say, oh, then then that could have a, an effect on Bob's qubit, right? But uh, uh because you know they're just in this entangled superposition state. Like it, 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 it doesn't. There, there's no change to the probability distribution over outcomes that Bob could see, and the probability distribution is all that Bob can notice when he measures, right? So it's like if Alice measures and sees a zero, then Bob will see a zero. If Alice measures and sees a one, then Bob will see a one. But Alice can't control whether she's going to get a zero or a one in order to send a bit of her choice to Bob, right? So. Um, uh, but 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 now in order to get this kind of uh, uh, you know it, impossibility of faster than light signaling, while also getting the Bell inequality violation, you need to be able to talk about the state of the world you know as being a quantum state or you know as being something that is not definite, right? And 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 this this is this is a huge problem if you really believe that the world is secretly this classical cellular automaton. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I made this point and then actually the, the same point got, got a lot of attention four years later when uh, John Conway, 
and Simon Koshin wrote a paper which was called the free will theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know if you you uh, saw this or remember. I, I've this, seen it. I, I'm not. I'm yeah, not yeah, familiar yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 what they what they said there, you know, was. Uh, you know, the, the the way they put it, they had a much more arresting way to put it than I did. They said, yeah, if, if humans have free will in choosing how to measure particles, then the particles themselves must also have free will. Right. And then, you know, that, that got all over, you know, the media and so forth. But, you know, what they meant was just that if there is no determinism in the choice of how you make the measurements, then you know, then then the the uh, um, outcomes of the measurements must also be indeterministic. You know, instead of you know, they 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 didn't need to use the word the word free will. They could have just talked about freshly generated randomness or something like that. Okay, but uh, um, you know, but but sort of the bell inequality is sort of a way to sort of get at the conclusion that randomness is this fundamental feature of of the laws of physics, right? And uh, and 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 in a few years after that, that idea was actually turned into practical protocols for using violations of the Bell inequality to generate certifiably random numbers, right? Which you could then mm. use for cryptographic applications. Mm. Okay, and uh, this is now something that you know has been experimentally demonstrated, like mm. at, at NIST. You know, NIST has this randomness beacon where like every 60 seconds, they broadcast 512 new random bits to the world. They're considering using the Bell inequality violation experiments as a way to, you know, uh, help get these certifiably random numbers, right? Because, you know, if you need, let's say, you know, you, you know, um, um, I don't know if you saw this, but just a few weeks ago, uh, Ethereum, which is one of the main cryptocurrencies, right? Which is valued at a hundred and something billion dollars, right? Uh, market cap, but they they switched from a proof of work, which is you know burning, you know, which means mm. you're 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 burning these massive amounts of electricity, like the, the total electricity usage of Portugal, right? You're spending to you know to to solve these puzzles that to you know decide who gets to add the next block to the blockchain. They've switched to a system that is far more climate friendly, where you mm. don't have to do any of that, but where you have, what you have to do is constantly run a lottery to decide who gets to add the next block to the blockchain, mm. right? Mm. And, um, um, you know, this is called proof of stake cri cryptocurrency, okay? And, and, and but, but the big challenge with making these fully secure is that you need a source of random numbers that everyone can trust. Okay. Mm, mm, so people mm. have talked about using these bell experiments to do to do that right now. Now, I wasn't thinking about any of these sort of practical uses when I made this point about why Stephen Wolfram was wrong 20 years ago. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, right. but but in some sense, you know, this is like you can see the seeds of it there. Right? I see. I see. I guess and, if you're, okay, maybe right. if you were in a now, different now, frame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so, so, you'd so, be so a billionaire. Wrote, okay. Yeah. So no. So, okay. so, then, so then I, I, I wrote this review and then, you know, I got a call from, you know, like, like the, from, from someone in, in his, uh, uh, in Wolfram research saying like, be at the phone at such and such time because Stephen might call you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And then, you know, he called me, I spent a couple of hours on the phone with me. He was actually very, very nice. It was, you know, had a very interesting conversation and, you know, but then, you know, regarding the bell inequality, he said, well, yeah, well, you're just wrong about that. And one of my employees has proved that you're wrong and, and uh, he's going to get in touch with you and then sort that out. So I said, okay. And so then I, I, uh, I had an ex email exchange with that employee over a week at the end of which, you know, that employee just agreed that I was right. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, but, but Wolfram, you know, didn't change anything about his, his view. Now, his his more recent thing, I mean, I mean, I see it as kind of mostly, you know, a, a, a reboot, except that, you know, he he still he still wants to explain quantum mechanics by some more fundamental thing underlying it. Uh, and, and but 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 he's now, you know, they're now talking about what they call the, 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 the you know, these multi-way cellular automata where, where we are, you know, you would have a, uh, uh, you know, it could, it could, it could evolve by all different possible sets of rules. And then you have to somehow sum over all of them. Right. And so now, yeah, that looks a little bit more like quantum mechanics. Right. So, yeah. So maybe that's slightly more promising, right. There's still no Hilbert space. So there's still no, like, like, I don't see any specifics of like 
how do you get out, you know, these sort of specific predictions that we know of, of quantum mechanics, right? And there's, again, this sort of the same kind of maybe stance that, that you see from Eric Weinstein of like, well, it's the, you know, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, you know, we're just discovering these fundamental structures and, and, and how to, how to get the predictions of existing physics. That's kind of a detail for the technicians to work out. Right. <laughs> so, there, you know, so there's still the, the, you know, this kind of attitude that I don't really know what to do with. <laughs> I see. Right. Actually, in this re regards, uh, so, yeah. so you said you did look at my paper or Weinstein's paper or both. I don't know. Did, did you, uh, I know this may be a little indulgent, but do you have any uh, quick thoughts or what, what did, what was your impression? I mean, I mean, it, 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 it I, I, I feel like as an, as an outsider, uh, I, I, I shouldn't really say, you know, except that, that you know, that this sort of, you know, your, your thing explained why probably if I, you know, knew you know um, 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 a lot more about about gauge theory and and the symmetry groups underlying the standard model. You know, my 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 default guess has to be that I would take the same stance that most people who are experts in those things would take. Um, you know, and and that 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 seems to be to agree with your paper. <laughs> oh, great, thank you. Um, well, uh, just just <laughs> yeah. uh, just yeah, just to close the loop on this. So so it seems that yeah. uh, Stephen hasn't, uh, I guess, adequately responded to to your criticisms. And uh, on on my end, actually, there's, there's kind of been a bit of a controversy that hasn't hmm. been fully oh. resolved in terms of how Eric and and Brian Keating have <laughs> responded to my criticisms oh. of geometric unity. So so actually, for those who don't know, Brian Keating, he's a, a distinguished professor of physics at uh, UC San Diego and, and the scientific community's uh, leading proponent of geometric unity. Uh, in fact, he stated that he wants to experimentally test theories of everything uh, mm -hmm. under the auspices of UCSD, in particular uh, Wolfram's theory and also Weinstein's. Uh, how he plans to do that remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, so, so I actually uh, talked to Wolfram in person just a, a year ago when he was here in Austin for South by Southwest, and I just oh. got an email okay. out of the blue that he wants to come talk. And so, you know, I'm oh, okay. sure. And yeah, you know, I had again, you know, a very cordial conversation with him. He's actually, you know, he's actually a very pleasant guy to talk to. Right. Oh. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and, and I kind of felt the, the, you know, to, to me, the almost like semi tragedy of it, right. That like, there is, you know, like there, 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 there is no one else who has like done as much to just make beautiful visualizations of what, you know, different cellular automata do, right? And I feel like that part of what he's doing is awesome, right? Mm, mm, and it's mm, kind mm. of, you know, if you took away the claims to be, you know, replacing quantum mechanics with, you know, something better and to have invented all of this stuff from, from, you know, from, from whole cloth, like, you know, like, like that, that is really a contribution to have these amazing visualization tools right you know which of course is related to you know what is what he's best known for which is creating mathematica right mm -hmm. um, yeah, i mean i mean you know it is it is part of you know the same software stack right that that that, that, that does all this stuff um or like, you know, he can, you know, even when he's like explaining, you know, concepts that I know very well, right? Like he can, for it, for every little variation of the concept, he has another beautiful diagram, right? To illustrate it, where like, like each of those diagrams might take me like hours or days to make, right? Whereas like, if you've, you know, learned Mathematica well enough, then you can generate each one in a matter of seconds, right? So, the, you know, that, that, that I feel like is the, is the the the, the uh, you know the, the the most interesting part of 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 what he's doing, and you know I am I mean I am partial to the idea that there is this sort of you know w w when we finally understand what are the laws of quantum gravity, right? You know the, you know they will uh, it will be in sort of computational terms. It will be you know I mean I mean I think it, it will it, it it may have to be quantum computational terms. Because I don't know how to replace quantum mechanics with something deeper, right? This is, you know, one of the main points of disagreement. But you know, you could have, uh, 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 you could imagine, you know, a, a quantum cellular automaton, right, or some discrete set of qubits that, you know, out of which space time, out of which space time is built. Right, and this is this and uh, this actually is what the loop quantum gravity people and the spin foam people, you know, have talked about for a long time. Of course, John Bias was very much part of that conversation, right? And then from a completely different direction, that is also what the string theorists talk about nowadays, right? With the it from qubit 
program for physics and with, with ADS CFT, right? They're also talking about sort of building up space time, you know, well, in their case, holographically, right? But ultimately uh, out of sort of discrete, you know, uh, uh, collections of qubits, right? Where, you know, actually the entropy in a given region of space should be finite and not infinite. Right. Mm, uh, mm. So, 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 so I think that, that, you know, ultimately, you know, thinking about cellular automata will be relevant to the foundations of physics. Right. Mm. But it's just, you know, you, you really have to engage with everything that physics already knows rather than, you know, mm. saying that, you know, like you can just reinvent it all from scratch and not worry about the details. Right? Mm, mm. So, um, yeah, but but you know, in, in this conversation, I did I, I should say I did keep trying to extract from Wolfram a clear prediction about quantum computing, right? Because okay. he okay. does keep wanting to say that, you know, that quantum computing should not be possible, you know, on the basis of his sort of uh, uh, ideas of you know how to how to uh, replace quantum mechanics with something deeper. But the trouble is that he will not make a firm prediction, you know, <laughs> saying, well, like if, 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 if quantum computing is possible, then that just means something else in terms of this, this branchial space that he talks about. So you know, it's like, it's like uh, you can, uh, um, you know, if, if quantum computing doesn't work or if it does work, there is a deep Wolframian explanation for that mm. either way. <laughs> I see. Well, at least he, he did make an effort to get back to you. Let me just contrast it with what I was about to say with Brian Keating oh, yeah, and, and Eric yeah, Weinstein. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they, you know, so, so there there's, there's this famous clubhouse discussion that mm. uh, they hosted, which people can find on the internet where yep. they dismissed my rebuttal based on the fact that I have a co-author who's anonymous. Uh, he goes by the pseudonym Theopolia. That was quite an unexpected uh, response. Uh, mm. You know, that, I'm sure you know, there, there's many innocuous reasons why someone would want to be synonymous. Uh, the commenters on your blog, you know, they, they just want to leave a comment. They don't want it tied to their personal identity necessarily. Mm. Uh, so it's unfortunate that's that's been their only response, even though they've sort of chastised the scientific community for not taking their work more seriously. Um, uh, you know, uh, at least, uh, you know, well, and, and unfortunately, I guess yeah, Wolfram I mean, also I, has I would it. think that, you know, as, as an outsider to the area, like clearly, clearly your paper deserved a thorough scientific response. Oh, thank you. Know, you. Thank regardless you. Regardless of, you know, if, if, if it had been scrawled in a bathroom urinal, you know, <laughs> by some anonymous person. Right. I mean, I mean that, yeah, that, 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 that just goes without saying that this is, you know, this is the kind of scientific criticism that, yeah, need, needs a scientific response. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I was yeah. just going to ask you, but you, 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 yeah. you've answered it for me. Basically, as scientists, we're, we're about uh, the, the, the content of the scientific criticisms, not about whether the critic is anonymous or, or yeah. otherwise, right? Yeah, I mean, now, it, now, yeah. now it's true that like when, when people post all of these anonymous comments on my blog, like I, you know, I often feel like there is an imbalance. Like I have to stand by everything that I say, right? And I can be mm. called to account for it, you know, 10 years later, right? And these anonymous commenters, like they, they have no similar obligation, right? They right. can just, you know, right. And, and, and so, you know, and, and, and that, that, that has been, you know, behind, you know, a lot of like, like when I, I try to sort of talk to them on equal terms and then they, they might ask me very personal questions and I feel like, a, you know, a, okay, if I'm, you know, uh, presenting myself as open and intellectually honest and all of that, then I should be answering that. But it's like, okay, you know, I don't get to do that to them. Right. Huh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, but, um, um, you know, and, and, and um, I think, you know, it, like w w with writing scientific papers, like like usually, like it is preferable to have you know like like uh, uh, names attached to it, like where you know if you disagree with this paper, then here is who to get in touch with. But in this case, you know, anyone who disagrees with your paper, well, they can get in touch with you. Exactly <laughs> right, and it's it's quite right? suspicious that that Brian and Eric have, have have refused that on all fronts. But anyways, I'm glad you you pointed yeah. that out, and yeah, yeah. it, it yeah, makes yeah. sense to you. And and yeah, and you're yeah. such a great role model in these sorts of things. So it was great to get your opinion. 